So I don't know what I have as an average for how long it takes me to discuss some sort of big purchase, but I do it certainly with real estate, but I also do it with cars and um, anything that's very large. I talk about it for an enormous length of time before I finally go ahead and, and do it. Um, I guess sometimes it, it never actually gets done, but a lot of times it, it does finally, it does finally get done. And sometimes when it gets done, it has the appearance of being sort of, um, sudden, but usually there's an awful lot of research that is in the background there might have been trips, exploration trips to other states, uh, more than one, and just, you know, hours pouring over Zillow and calls to realtors and sometimes seeing property. These days, sometimes it's virtual. I've had realtors uh, go through property with their cameras. I mean, I won't do that willy nilly. I've been, I thought a little bit serious and, um, like I was, I thought I was serious today. I thought the two of us were going to make a trip to Gettysburg and we made an appointment on Friday. We set up the appointment for today and, um, we were going to make a road trip to Gettysburg. And so that spun off of a series of events that seemed to get closer to the target. So, um, you know, I had been looking at property and, um, I don't know, I, I, I was going, well, I kept, I kept going back to Pittsfield, Massachusetts because it had very good prices and they had multi, multi-family houses. So I kept going back there and kept looking back there. And there was one property that I was interested in. And I called, it was a for sale by owner and she was talking, she had owned it for 10 years and talking about how she set up a garden house out of a shed. And um, we were talking about all sorts of things, but after I got off the phone all through the night, when I woke up in the morning, I started to realize that I myself wanted to be inside that garden room. You know, so on the one level, I was talking about management companies that could do this remotely and, and get tenants. And she mentioned a management company. She mentioned, you know, a lot of people were trying to do what I was doing. Um, uh, being out of state and and managing the two units remotely. And I was talking about, you know, uh, getting tenants for the both the two units. But somehow or another, my mind was still um, kind of wanting to dabble and renovate one or both of the units. And then almost wanting to spend time in the garden room in the backyard. Well, how I, how was I going to do that if there was two long-term tenants in there? I mean, yes, I could just start out there, um, not renting one or both and, and play around and do some renovations and, and I guess do something in the garden room while I was not having the places rented, but the whole purpose of doing that would have simply been money 
uh, that's all it would have been. And so then I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of missing my why. I, I watch uh, Richard on an Airbnb channel that I haven't really watched him for a long time. And he always talks about what, what is your why? What, what are you doing this for? And he talks about, you know, pick your properties also because it's a location that you like to go for whatever reason. You know, it, if it's a straight money play, well, you might as well be in the stock market or something. So, um, so I thought, okay, well, maybe I can solve this particular issue with having one unit being a long-term rental, one of the units being an Airbnb. So I thought, well, that could work um, because then I could have the ability to visit the area in the summer, uh, carve out my time as the Airbnb, have it furnished the way I wanted it, and um, okay, I would have to get a maid and, and things. And well, assuming I could do that, assuming I could find somebody to let people in and out, it's a little tricky, totally little, not as easy for sure. But if I could do that, then, you know, then that kind of gives me the ability to play with my investment. It's a little bit more my house and I have the ability to travel there. Well then travel how? Um, it's not right around the corner. Um, it's, it's seasonal with respect to you'd want to go there in the summer. Well, I have a pool here in Virginia in the summer. This is a place that I like to be in the summer. So, oh, okay, maybe I can split the summer, I, I suppose, maybe. Um, but then how, okay, so driving to Pittsfield is, it's not bad. I could do it once or twice. Okay, the airport that people use for Pittsfield is the Albany Airport. I went on YouTube and I looked at the Albany Airport. Well, what's the size of the, of the roads? How big and scary are they? Well, I'd have to rent a car. Okay, so then what, pay for car rental for how long would I be staying? A week, two weeks, car rental? Um, in the end, it's like, I, you know, that was just simply unrealistic. I chose Pittsfield for some kind of nostalgic reason that there had been a time when a lot of relatives had been living in Pittsfield. There had been thriving businesses in Pittsfield. Every, my cousins, um, everybody's gone from Pittsfield. In fact, even reading between the lines uh, from, uh, from the owner, um, I could, eventually I, I realized she was describing that the fourplex next door was using such and such management company. She didn't say like Mabel, uh, the owner Mabel next door is using such and such uh, management company. She didn't know the neighbor next door. Um, so she was in a street full of maybe um, owners that lived in New York or something. You know, she was just uh, kind of a relic from uh, days gone by. She was living there 10 years where the norm had previously been where you typically had the situation where you had the owner living in the multifamily and they would rent the other remaining units. But now it's more and more of a common situation where the, the owner is not living in those multifamilies. It's just filled with tenants. And um, so 
also the, that also means that the demographic has completely changed the um um she mentioned for instance that um uh one of the potential buyers that um and, and i would have had to confirm this but it's just uh, it, it's speaks to the changing demographic she was saying that um that uh, as far as how much um i could get for the unit she said she charges a thousand dollars for the unit um, below she says but one of the people that was came close to buying the unit ch uh, checked with the housing authority and they told her that uh section eight um pays twelve hundred and forty dollars per month for a three bedroom two no a three bedroom one bath it's hard to actually get more than one bath for a rental unit and they would pay more if the heat was not included if i'm saying that right but um but the way that rolled off the tongue so fast um uh that even came up when i was talking to a different realtor um this section eight um came up just in casual conversation like that's just sort of a measurement you know real you know oh it's almost a benefit, you know, when you can have Section 8 people um, as your tenants. Because then I think you might even get the checks straight from the, you know, like not the tenant, but the town or, or something like that. So that you get it actually very regularly and and it comes in faithfully. But it's like very common. Um that that's your demographic that you're working with. So you're not really working with people that are employed. Um, there's, there's a not, there's not a lot of employment in the town. Uh, there used to be, that's why all those, um, that's why all those multifamily, um, apartment complex were, were built in the first place is because it was a company town. GE was there and, and factories were there and it, they needed it all, um, for all the workers. But, um, those workers either had tool boxes or they had briefcases and they were all going to work. But now, no, that's not the case. So, um, so basically, uh, I'm talking this through here. I'm processing kind of this on the fly. It's like, yeah, you're, you are not having a situation where the owners, um, are living side by side with all of their section eight tenants. It's, you know, the, the people that can buy these, um, complexes. Yeah they're not kind of the same type of people, you know? Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, um, and, um, um, the owner, she, she said that she had to, uh, she, she ended up losing a sale because she had a problem getting out uh, the tenant on the bottom level, he, the tenant didn't want to leave and she almost had to evict him. So she didn't even, she didn't even have a tenant that was like a friendly type. It was just like, she sort of ended up taking like whoever she got. Um, and I had a little bit of a vision for some reason well, I had this vision as if I was going to be living in one of those units and then have some friendly person living under or over me. And it's like as if I was going to know them and as if like every morning we were going to have like muffins and coffee together. Like where was I getting all that? Um, 
I, I don't know. That, but that was my multifamily scenario that I was drumming up. Um, so, you know, talking to her uh, was very, very, very useful. Um, so, I, you know, I was able to just sort of, she wasn't, you know, really trying to, you know, she, possibly if she knew what she was saying, maybe she would have tried to revise her speaking. I don't know. But, um, but it was just kind of became clear that she was, she wasn't having kind of any book club meetings or any kind of, uh, get togethers with any of the tenants along the street. They didn't have block parties. Um, th there was just nothing really in her chit chat that, uh, gave any, 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 any drop of a hat of like that. She used the, the maid from, you know, the next door or that, you know, they did their shopping together or it wasn't just any kind of dribble that, uh, or, you know, any kind of indication like, yeah, she uses the teenager that lives, you know, in the upper unit, um, of the, you know, house across the street or just nothing, you know, nothing whatsoever. And, and I sort of, um, had thought, oh, well, maybe this is a different type of lifestyle for me that might be beneficial, uh, with different people clo in, a, in a closer knit, uh, scenario. And that seemed to be, no, that's not the case. Then they seem to be a different type of people that I'm used to being around. And, um, you know, not to say that, uh, well, I'm currently, let's just say, giving them, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Now, um, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of these types of houses have, have porches. Um, now every once in a while when you're doing, um, when you are seeing in Google, in Google maps, they show you like front views and you can kind of almost like walk the streets with whatever Google has taken a picture of every once in a while, you'll see like somebody is outdoors, like they've caught them. Um, once in a blue moon, you'll catch somebody and they're outdoors on their deck and they might be smoking. Um, and, and then you can, you know, see what nationality they are also. So, um, uh, moving, jumping over to Gettysburg just so happens that, um, the, uh, the unit right to the left hand side of the, uh, unit that I was going to look at. Uh, there was an older man, he was white, um, but he was smoking out in his deck and the, the units were very close together. Now in the, um, uh, listing, I mean, it, it, it showed very nicely. It was all decked out and everything but I did notice that they just so happened to have put a privacy screen, like a wide blind. Um, so you wouldn't have seen that guy if he was out there smoking, but you would have still smelled it. But, um, uh, you know, I don't know how strong or whatever, but, and, and I, I don't know if it would have been bad enough where like if I had been spending a weekend, a week or something. If I had initially wanted to just sit out, sit out on the deck. And if he was out, out there smoking, would that have made me decide to go in? 
I don't know. Would it have been that strong? I don't know. But, um, but, uh, but anyway, um, oh, so, um, but back to Pittsfield, um, some of the pictures that Google captures, occasionally there were some pictures of, oh, there might have been five, six, um, 20 somethings, we'll say, 20 somethings, um, of a certain nationality. And, um, so, you know, you can get, uh, an idea as to the trend of the neighborhood and, um, and depending on which way you want to start to take any kind of guesses, you know, um, if you want to go to the another extreme, if you know, uh, um, you know, are they outstanding citizens of the community, um, or are they out looking for trouble? I mean, sometimes when you know you get, sometimes when you get four, five people roaming around together you know what are they doing so um so there were neighborhoods that then even translated to okay so google didn't catch that in every single neighborhood but translate that to there is a six family on this street, well, not only this one, but on this same street, there's a six family, six family, six family, six family, six family, you know, right down the road. And across from it, there's a four family, six family, three family, two family, six family, whatever. You have a lot of people, a lot of all age people, these are not all, no, they're, they're, it is a older crowd, but this is, it's not completely filled with, um, 70 year olds. You know, it's not, it's not all 70 year olds. So, um, you know, I mean, I could have, I could have bought a house. Well, in the extreme, there could have been a crack house, you know, a couple of doors down, um, uh, possibly, you know, if you don't know. And, um, if somebody, if I had bought like that and I hadn't done my due diligence and then I just tried to keep quiet and then sell, you know, let's say a year later and somebody else had come along and had done more proper due diligence, well, the chances of me selling, you know, are going to be, <laughs> so, um, so, um, what I then decided to do is to say, okay, well, unfortunately, um, you know, Pittsfield is not what it had been. Uh, there is a reason that landlords, um, are putting the most minimal repairs into these old houses and they're they are renting anyway the linoleum is like 75 years old and cracking and peeling and yet people are renting them and um i would have had a real tough time 
going, you know, just going forth and just renting. Like, I would have been so tempting to bring in crews of people and like, no, give me a new floor. I'll, I, I just want a new floor just because. I just want a new floor. You know, and then I may have gotten the the bad tenants and the new floor may not have stayed a new floor very long. Um, but, you know, it's like, walk away, walk away. There's a reason that you can buy those multifamily houses for pennies on the dollar. You know, blue light special, Kmart, blue light special. Buy one, buy a dozen, you know? Um... Yeah, it, it, it's shocking, but, it, you know, when it's too good to be true, well, yeah, why is it? Why is it that way? So, um, then, then that led me to, okay, well, Gettysburg, so I had thought about Airbnb initially for Pittsfield to um, make it, turn it into a fun factor until, okay, no. So then, um, I then said, I was looking still for smaller prices because, um, you know, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't want to sell anything that I currently had. So, you know, um, I had to use a smaller budget so, um, I saw something in Gettysburg that seemed good. Um, at first I saw, when I show things to Mike and he sees Fixer Upper, I, in one sense, I think, well, is he just afraid to, you know, deal with Fixer Uppers? But then he kind of talks me into the price of all the repairs and then when you put two side by side and one is already fixed up and, and yes, the, the one that's already fixed up is more expensive, but then, then it finally dawns on me that, yeah, they're going to come out equal by the time you fix up the fixer upper. So, um, so then I got initially really excited about the one that was turnkey. Um, it was set up to be an Airbnb right out of the gate. You could negotiate on the furniture. Um, I'm not sure whether it was set up with like pots and pans and, and uh, some, some uh, they do that to some of the, um, some of the uh, places in Florida um, that are seasonal rentals that they'll put wine openers in the drawers and everything. So I, I don't know if it was set up to that degree, but, um, but there, there was bed, bed sheets and um, beds and furniture and um, uh, things hanging on the walls and things. And uh, it was just very, very nicely done. And um, so um, initially it looked like it was priced well well enough so that um, it could have been a decent Airbnb. And then it still would have been something uh, close enough you know, not a 10 hour drive or eight hour, eight to 10 hour drive, depending on how many stops and things like that. But, um, close enough to where I, I live so that, um, either me by myself or us together could go there and have a weekend retreat, carve out some slots from the Airbnb schedule and, and us also be able to have a retreat and to, to make sure that, you know, we would maintain the place and, 
and, you know, check it out and, you know, any kind of repairs or anything like that, maintenance. Um, you know, I wouldn't have to fly to the Albany airport, you know, rent a car and all that kind of stuff. It would just be much, much, much more within range. And, and so, you know, so initially, at least coming, coming from the Pittsfield, Massachusetts perspective, it seems like, well, that would make so much more sense. And Pittsfield was kind of around sort of nothing. Um, but Gettysburg is a destination for people based on history. That's not going to change. It's not going to go out of business. It's, it's always going to be Gettysburg. It's going to be history. There's a lot of events around Gettysburg. So we set up the appointment to go to go uh, take a look at the property. Well, in the meantime, I went to um, Airbnb and took a look at different reviews and what people were pricing their, their houses and their rooms for. And at first I thought, oh, that, that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good price. And that's pretty good. Um, you know, I saw August, 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 um, as far as people, um, how often that they were renting. But then I noticed weekend, 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 and it wasn't even clear what a weekend meant that they come Friday and Saturday? Did they only stay Saturday night? But even if it was Friday and Saturday, or even if it was Saturday and Sunday, that's two nights. It could only be one night. I wasn't really sure, but that wasn't, that wasn't Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That wasn't even a couple of nights during, during the week. It was mostly a weekend rental that most people were renting and I thought boy that's gonna be a real long payoff for that unit I mean I could factor in some amount of well you know I would get some benefit from it but over the time that I've been living in Northern Virginia since 1987, I've been to Gettysburg exactly once, twice, twice I've been to Gettysburg. So Gettysburg has not had a real pull for me. It's not like I'm always racing to Gettysburg to spend time in Gettysburg. So, you know, um, I had to say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, um, you know, call the realtor, call it off. Um, it doesn't work out. Uh, the return on investment is not there. And my, my why, um, my personal draw to Gettysburg is not really there either. So I've, I'm at 33 minutes and now I'm going to talk about Emporia, Virginia. I'll put this in the timer. 33 minutes. I'm at Emporia, Virginia. Now this can change when I wake up tomorrow, but I put in the contact me in Trulia because they've got my wrong email address stuck inside uh, Zillow. But um, in Poirier, Virginia, there's a house that's nasty looking, but they ha something has to be wrong with the house in order for me to be able to afford it because, you know, I'm accumulating some property. And, you know, when you start to add on to your portfolio of houses, well, they get nastier and nastier when you do because you start running out of money. So, so yeah, my houses are starting to look pretty darn sucky. Sorry, but, but that's the way it goes. So I'm going to have to start putting in some sweat equity on these houses that are looking nasty. All right. So the nasty house that I'm looking at now, um, yeah, so, so basically, these, these, this collection of houses now, um, the, th 
thing they all have in common, which you might be wondering now, wait, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Gettysburg, Virginia, Emporia, Virginia, oh, and did I mention, uh, you know, there, there was, you know, there was a, a church for $65,000 in who knows where. It was along the Appalachian Trail where no man, no man, no man, you know, it's like, yeah, try to get a bride out there. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's either going to be in no man's land it's going to be either completely run down. Um, uh, you're either going to have like uh, all of the structure, like the plumbing and the electrical are going to be all, you know, out of service or, or the lot is going to be really tiny or, one that initially looked interesting. It was in Henderson. It was in Henderson, North Carolina. Like, how did I get myself there? I don't know. But there was this massive power grid um, that was practically over overhead. But this one teeny tiny house was kind of down a dead end. But yet it was only on a quarter of an acre it kind of it almost looked like it had more land than that, but that was because it was practically underneath this massive power grid. So you almost had that extra space if you wanted to be vibrating underneath this massive power grid. And then it had sort of a swamp underneath it. And, um, yeah, and then and then it was run down, and it didn't have hot water. It didn't have yeah yeah. There was no water heater. There was no heater. There was no window air conditioner or, or anything. It you know everything was like unhooked, and you know it's like and it was small, and it was just um. So yeah, sometimes when you start out at like, well, it's $50,000. Yeah. Well, I think I can buy a she shed for like $30,000. I, I don't know. So it's like, well, yeah, yeah. But, um, so, um, so, um, so I found it a ugly looking house in Emporia, which, okay, yeah, what the heck is that place? Well, it's a long I-95. It's got that going for it. It's, it's right at the, uh, southern border of Virginia, just to, just before you leave Virginia and enter North Carolina. So there's some hotels around there, some gas stations, and a few places to eat. So <coughs> it's not really set up as like um it almost should set it almost should set itself up like a, a miniature south of the border, like last stop before you leave Virginia. It almost could maybe gain some no notoriety if it would do that. But, um, uh, we discovered it, me, Mark, well, me and Mark. And, um, so me, Mark and the kids stopped at Emporia, Virginia one year because, um, I was so anxious to get going on our beach trip one year that, um, that I said, well, um, how about if we gathered up? Cause it was hard to gather up two families. Like his family, his kids lived with his mom and my kids lived with me. Um, but even still, sometimes they spent time over their dad. So it was like, 
okay, kids, uh, yeah. Like, and then Mark worked and stuff. So I said, and then we had to decide, well, if we were going to leave in the morning, that meant then everybody would have to either, okay, were you going to, was his kids going to stay at his mom's for the night? Or were, were we going to try to ha have everybody stay at our house the night before we left for the, for the beach? Well, the advantage, if we left right after Mark got home from work, is we could just simply get going. We could just get on the road. And so I mapped it out and I said, well, we could get to Emporia. And, and I remember everybody said, where is Emporia? And I said, well, there's a hotel there. And we could just there's a hotel and it gets us to the, till, you know, we're just about out of Virginia. When we get to in there's a hotel. And then when we wake up, um, so we get like, I forget what it was. I don't know if it was six or four. I don't know if it was four to six hours worth of driving that it got us after work couldn't have been six hours it might have been four it was probably four hours of I don't know what it was but um it was a short it's probably we'll say four because Richmond is 90 miles I don't know we'll say three or four I don't know hours of driving that it got us after work but it just it was enough to just get us corralled after work and and then we then could eat dinner together and we were all in one place and so we then you know knew that we were going to be sleeping in one place rather than them at their moms and our kids there because if we had to pick them up at his mom's the next morning then there would be you just would know that oh well she had to go to her friend's house she'll be back soon he had to go over to like no no we've got to hit the road now so it was just worth it. It was. It would have been practically worth it if we had only gotten a half an hour, you know, down the road and just gotten the kids corralled. So at least you know we got we got past Richmond, and we got right on the line of like we we can practically see North Carolina from our from our porch, you know, almost like doing the Sarah Palin, you know. That's kind of like what what Emporia will do. I can see North Carolina from my doorstep here. So, um, so the uh, so the house um is on a large lot. And um, it can be it can be improved. The exterior is not so nice looking. The interior is not so nice looking, but it has the systems, and they work. Everything flushes hot water. Apparent. I mean, they say you know that everything functions. It works. It's hooked up. Um, and, um, there's a partial fence and, um, it's not, it's not slotted inside suburbia. It's a little bit spaced, which is good for an Airbnb because you don't want, you know, this neighbor, that neighbor, that neighbor, and that neighbor to say there's a lot of cars coming in and out all the time. 
and it's not like that. It's, it's spaced. So, um, and I think with, um, with that unit, one thing, one addition that would be good is to put a Tesla charger in it and be able to feature that that's part of the Airbnb because it's like a road trip kind of thing, you know, so you can't, I mean, each Airbnb, I mean, if it, if it does have a uniqueness, a lot of Airbnbs, you know, are just sort of a bed, but, but if, if an Airbnb does have a particular uniqueness, I mean, some Airbnbs are maybe on a farm or some are like, stay in a, a, a yurt or, you know, there, there's some kind of unique quality of the Airbnb and mine in this case could be charge up your electric car while you're staying over. And because it's a north south type of a, um, spot, I, I, it would seem like that would be a good feature. So, and, and I think, you know, even though I myself have in the past had the ability to do some of these drywall type repairs, I don't think that I would, I would take 10 times as long to uh, do these. I think I would hire people and oversee the jobs and, and Mike's not really the greatest about doing things um, either. So I think I would just oversee this, but I've put my contact number in on this. And if I wake up, Oh, I hope I don't change my mind on this because of course I did say the same thing about the uh, Gettysburg one. I said, Oh, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. But the other thing that I have also put contact information on is to add an apartment on top of my garage. Now, the thing is, is though that that would be interesting. It's just that there's no systems in place for doing that. I mean, there's no plumbing, there's no HVAC, there's no, that does not sound easy to me. Now there's two people in the neighborhood that have done it. And, um, Mike called a neighbor that, um, he kind of knows and we haven't gotten a call back yet. And we drove by another one that he knew of. And, uh, I contacted the builder on that one. And so probably tomorrow we'll, I'll, we'll probably start getting calls for those and, um, I'll get estimates. Now they may be really backed up and things, but, um, but anyway, so that's an, that's another thought, but, but yeah, that's my going interest. And again, sometimes, unfortunately, my interests they just kind of drop off. Unfortunately, I hate, 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 hate when that happens. Um, and it did just don't, it also dawned on me that my house in Florida has been furnished for all this time. And I also have a tiny house in the back as well. That's not currently furnished. And I haven't done anything with Airbnb on it. And I think that is going to change because the stock market had a horrendous week. I lost a lot of money in one short week and you know, it's all well and good when, um, well, I mean the vast amount of time that Donald Trump was in office. Hey, maybe it was a coincidence. I don't know. I can't speculate, but, um, the vast amount of time that he was in office, the stock market was doing good. And I, I, Hey, money is always good. 
So I made, you could say, I maybe should have just simply tried to Airbnb my Florida house. Why, sh why shouldn't I? Why wouldn't I have done that? But necessity brings on um, more creative thinking. And so with a more rocky portfolio now, I'm starting to think, you know, um, I need to start getting smarter about things. And, um, you know, I've got assets that are just not giving a payoff here. So, you know, I, I wasn't really thinking about my Ocala house in the same way. And here I am looking for a potential Airbnb in other places. And then, oh, what about my Ocala house? It's like, we have a cleaning lady that goes in there. She even starts up my car that's sitting there. She's very equipped to, um, I, we, we would need to ask her, but, um, I, I think she'd be very equipped to handle Airbnb people. Certainly do, certainly do the, the changeovers anyway, the made changeovers for sure. And if she didn't want to handle the people in and, or, in and out, I can do automatic door um, coding. And then there's other ways to do it. Um, there are virtual hosts. Uh, there are other people that can show up for you. And um, there's different ways to do it. So um, I need to, I need to get going with that. Plus, um, if I'm, I say if, when I go to Ocala for the winter, um, I'm not sure what Mike is planning on doing right now, but there's still a tiny house available and he's not going to be living in the tiny house. So I think we, we were both talking about together making a plan and fixing up the tiny house and having that as being a BM, Airbnb efficiency. And regardless of, of us being there, um, having that get rented as an Airbnb or even a, or even a short term, like for a nurse or a visiting nurse or whoever wants to uh, rent it, but have that be income. Why not? I don't know what the heck I'm thinking. I'm just leaving a lot of money on the table here. So, um, you know, my father never, uh, never did the Airbnb thing. He just, uh, let his, um, other property just sit. And the daughters right now are paying the price for that, uh, you know, it's been, um, getting, it's been a lot of months now. Um, and there's been no bites whatsoever on the Virginia property. Um, it's a 55 plus building and there's been, there's only been like two people who have even walked through there and there's been no interest whatsoever. It had been a briefly short, short hot market, but especially that building, you have to be 55 plus. It's, it's not Florida in Virginia. So, um, and currently they're, they're saying it's probably not going to help to lower the price right now. That's what they're saying. We might change our mind, but right now it's like there's not even any phone calls to say like are you flexible with the price there's just not any interest there's not any anything going on um so i mean 
pro I mean, I would think that a coming in at a bargain basement price may do the job and that's maybe what we'll have to do. But I do remember, um, I do remember back in 1991, 92, there was a recession and I was getting a divorce at the time and that our house that we had together had to get sold. And, um, we had a a reverse mortgage. No, 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 no. It was called a negative equity loan is what it was called. And uh, we really couldn't uh, keep going down forever with that loan. But it wasn't selling and it wasn't selling. And um, six months went by. Um, I tried to sell it with my roommates and but they had a they had a dog and they were occupying the dining room because I was I was renting out as many rooms as I could so they they had a bed a bed in the dining room and stuff and I finally then said I have to give you your notice because I'm gonna have to put this house back together in the way it's supposed to look and um and then we, you know, continued and tried it that way, took new pictures and all that. And it still wasn't selling and, um, tried the realtor kept on coming in and she kept on suggesting other things. Oh, I see cobwebs here at your entry and just everything under the sun. Then the season changed. And when my creeping flocks came into bloom, she she, you know, did a whole nother set of pictures and everything like that. And, and then we did a couple of rounds of price reductions. And, um, and then finally, when a buyer came in, he knocked it down another 10%. Um, but he was the only game in town. So, um, I finally had to take his offer. Um, and I mean, that was no 55 plus that was, you know, um, but that was sold. I'm not sure if that was sold at, at a loss. Um, well, yeah, because, because of what we, we added on the deck and things like that. So I guess it was sold as, at a loss. Um, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was six months for, um, a, like a, like, um, I mean, there was nothing, nothing odd about it. Um, I mean, in the case with my parents building, uh, you would expect that to be a longer lead time with 55 being the restriction. So, um, I'm trying to figure out what my point was to say, to mention that long length of time. Well, I guess, I guess my point was, is that that was a case that knocking down the price, nothing was going to happen until that one buyer came along that wanted that house. And it didn't seem to really matter. Like what, what happened with the price? Yeah, I guess that was my point. So, um, yeah. Oh, I guess my other point was that, um, yeah. So my father never Airbnb any of his properties. You know, he lived in one and then he had two others that were empty. Well, he could only be in one at a time. And so all this length of time that there had been three of them that we, as the sisters going through the probate, we were maintaining them. We were paying condo fees, HOA fees, activity fees for the villages. Now, 
I don't want to complain because, you know, eventually the payoff is, is, you know, I can't complain. He could have, he could have given things to charity or something like that. He gave, you know, I, we were all, well, he never had a will per se, but I mean, um, because he didn't have a will, the states dictate that it gets, you know, goes down to the, the heirs, the daughters. Um, so, you know, we will, you know, we will be the beneficiaries. And so we, there's nothing to complain about. But um, the thing is, is this was costly. Not having anybody paying rent on any of them. None of them. <laughs> Three properties. Three, you know sets of utilities and boy those condo fees and um property taxes and um and then there were breakages um a water heater went bad and um a, a panes of glass went bad and you know houses can get pricey um so, um, yeah, you just want them gone. So, um, and then there's even things like, yeah, it's too bad that he spent thousands of dollars on electrified couches, all leather, you know, all leather and um, wall units and, um, dining room sets and beds, moving beds and things and had to get sold pennies on the dollar, basically. Um, but hey, um, I would still, I would still, I, I will go down saying, um, that, um, he had fun shopping for those specific pieces of furniture that he fell in love with, that he chose for the village's house. And even with him deciding to go to Florida twice and buy that village's house, that meant that he didn't want to spend the rest of his life, which was only two years, but um, he didn't want to spend the rest of his life alone. He was going to find a partner. And maybe if COVID hadn't hit, maybe if... Um, You know, could have, would have, should have, you know, maybe if his kidneys had held out a little longer and if he had found a partner who was maybe a nurse or something, you know, um, uh, I don't know, maybe he could have gone another couple of years, you know, but he tried. He tried and... Um, he wasn't always feeling the best, but he, he had the money to do it. It was his money. He worked for it. Um, that's what you, that's what you earn money for. It's your money. So more power to him. So, um, so. Um, but the lessons that I have learned from him, um, was that now he, he, he did go ahead. I mean, he did go ahead in his later life and he, he did, you know, open up his wallet and he did buy the properties and he did furnish them with 
good furniture. And he did actually buy a nice Buick car. Um, earlier on in life, that wasn't the case. <laughs> um, but later on, he, he, he did, you know, do things that actually surprised me. So the lessons in life that are takeaways for me is that, um, you know, I don't want to wait quite as long in my life. You know, I want to be a little bit healthier than he was to uh, start doing some of those things. Um, you know, he he waited until he was um, so safe, you know, so financially safe. Um, but, but by that time he was also un, unhealthy, you know, so, um, so, I mean, also with his help, with his financial help, um, I'm going to be safe enough and I'm safe enough that I've, I've decided to pass on some of this goodness to my kids um, rather than having them need to wait until I die. Um, because um, I tried to drop a couple of hints to him that, you know, there's this tax loophole that he could have given a gift of whatever it was, $15,000 or something like that each year to his children, you know, because he had so much, you know, that he could have just started to just dribble it away, dribble it, you know, um, where he wouldn't have noticed it whatsoever, but his adult children could have used it a little bit. So, you know, I decided to do what I was advising him to do, um, for the same reasons, because the younger generation can, you know, can get more bang for the buck. Um, so, so, you know, his, a uh, hard or his and my mother's, you know, hard earned, packed away pennies and nickels and dimes and dollars that they really, you know, they didn't get that extra, um, I mean, they, they really, you know, they, they, no dessert, no, no frills, no extra, no, nothing extra. Um, all their life, um, not until they very, very, very late in life. Um, so, um, so, but anyway, um, I'm now, uh, it's been two and a half years, I think that I bought my Ocala house and, um, so that's, you know, the dust has settled from that. And, you know, I've been looking ever since. And, um, um, well, I, I, I mean, I had a, a little, a little bit of buyer's remorse afterwards. I thought maybe it should have been bigger it should have had two houses on, houses on it. It should have been a farm. It should have had horse stables for like goats or something. Uh huh. But I'm I'm back to being fine with the Ocala house, and now I'm in the mindset that uh, you know I want something. I, I saw somebody that bought a firehouse in Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, he rents it out for uh, photo shoots in front of the existing fire truck inside, 
and there's a fee for that and he uh, he rents it out for weddings i think it's three thousand dollars um he rents it out for airbnbs so there's money getting hauled in left and right for that i have no idea what it cost to buy um so i i don't know if i mentioned but i had seen um a wedding chapel very 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 basic you could barely recognize it as being a wedding that well not a wedding chapel just a church um but it was sort of along the appalachian trail and it just it was totally in the middle of nowhere um it uh it said on the deed that it was supposed to be kept as a place of worship um it had all the pews still in it and then it had a room behind it and it had one bathroom um so i don't know really if you could have let's say rented the room behind it as an airbnb sleeping place but my thought was that maybe you could rent it for weddings or something you know and charge i was thinking five hundred dollars maybe for a wedding now you know, he's getting three thousand um so i thought you know a private wedding um but again it's like the location to get a whole wedding party to go out into nowhere it's on sort of i don't know if i would call it a main drag um but it's not like it's not like it's backdropped to a barn or anything it's just mm. so you know that that's the thing it takes a long 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 time to find just the right place for something like this to work within budget where you can get a return on investment that you personally have got sort of the skills that you can the, the skills or the know-how to find the people um especially these days people that will work um that want to work um and that you yourself have got some kind of interest that that you can travel to um that you want to travel to that you might want to spend some time yourself there also so for me um uh now i generally fly to florida i've got a separate car there but if i've got um an airbnb in in foria now i mean that doesn't really save that much on a trip to florida um but it would if i'm let's say wanting to go to myrtle beach or something um or even virginia beach um maybe that does get me to virginia beach more often because then you know you can spend a little time there at the for your place and then it's like oh well then just popping over to virginia beach is not as agonizing um so it, it just it just kind of adds to the options for for traveling and then you know even for going to florida if it's a road trip then that's a stop that's a night nice stop so and i i just i don't know I just, um, it's a safe stop. It's not stopping in the middle of like Richmond or something, um, Baltimore or, you know, um, and you know, it's got enough space so that the neighbors wouldn't start talking of like, Ooh, all these people, Airbnb, 
I gotta call him up. I gotta report them to the town. Um, you don't want that. So. Okay, wow, have I talked. Okay. All right, that's all. Bye-bye.